Now it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Alberto Rodriguez. Alberto uh, leads the effort at Boston Dynamics to make uh, Atlas, their electric humanoid, uh, dexterous, along with other, uh, other behaviors. Before joining Boston Dynamics, Alberto was a professor at MIT for many years, where he ran the M-Cube Lab and became well known with many best paper awards for pioneering efforts in both model-based robot manipulation as well as learning-based uh, robot manipulation using tactile sensing. So please join me in welcoming Alberto. Thank you, Kevin, for the introduction. Uh, and it's great to be back at ICRA. Um, as some of you might know, um, about three and a half years ago, I decided to join Boston Dynamics. And uh, shortly after, I decided to do that uh, full time and step down from my position at MIT. And um, uh, one of the things that uh, I was able to do through that transition is um, spend um, a significant amount of time, especially the first couple of years, visiting factories. Um, maybe for obvious reasons, I visited many car manufacturing plants. Uh, this is uh, HMGMA, which is uh, the newest Hyundai uh, car plant in Savannah, 200 miles from here. Uh, it's very beautiful. Um, but I also visited other kinds of uh, manufacturing plants in um, construction or in uh, electronic fabrication. Um, and a couple of things come to mind uh, as like first revelations that came. The first one it's like, well, many of the things that people are doing here are extremely hard. They're like um, uh, entirely whole body operations uh, going inside the car, and they're, all of them, many of them are like extremely haptic driven, um, very dexterous. Um, but then the second revelation, probably more important, is that the reason many of these tasks, or the reasons why many of these tasks are not automated today, it's not because they're complex. Like the set of tools that um, um, like automation engineers have today to automate these tasks can't deal with this complexity. We break them down and, um, and we make it work. But nevertheless, many of these tasks are not automated today. And I just wanted to start the talk with have, um, diving a little bit deeper into, uh, into that thought. Okay, so what's the automation challenge in manufacturing? Um, if you look at it, this two uh, large groups of tasks that are, have largely been not automated. Um, and we can call them material handling and general assembly. So think of a uh, factory for simplicity as a large assembly line where things get put together and then a giant funnel that just makes sure that every part is in the right place at the right time, right? The assembly line has to be extremely efficient so you cannot lose half a second uh, without the part not being there. So um, automation engineers have developed many workflows, um, sequencing, heating, racking, placing parts in jigs to make sure that the assembly line is always operating and is always ready to do the, the right thing. Um, and then there's general assembly. And here's where you have um, most of the haptic driven behaviors. Almost everyone in the assembly line is doing something that involves moving wires and plugging connectors, or threading bolts, um, or doing some sort of, some sort of insertion. Um, so <clears throat> the, the, the main reasons when, when you ask as to why this task is not automated, first of all is that the task mix, mix is very high. So if you look at them, every person is doing a different job. And it's often the case that um, it's the opposite, right? There's, that you cannot find, it's not that you cannot find two people that are doing the same job, it's that one person is doing more than one thing. Um, like in, <clears throat> in material handling, for example, you get tens of thousands of parts, and um, each one, for each one, there's hundreds of varieties, right? So in the same assembly line, um, you might assemble uh, seven or two, 10 different car, cars, and each one has its own trim model, right? Like the sports, the sedan, the, uh, the high-end, and each one has like 10 different colors. So when you multiply for each one of the 10,000 parts, especially in the exterior, you might have hundreds of variants. And each one, just for supply chain stability, might come from three to five different suppliers. So it turns out that the, the variety of behaviors that you have to do to just handle one single part is, uh, is very high. Uh, so that's just very hard to automate because every task is different. 
Um, and then there's like very long sequences of highly dexterous manipulation, which can be broken down and automated, but it just takes too much fixturing. It takes too much space that doesn't exist uh, in the assembly line, or it just would take uh, a factory that is like giant. And that's just economically not viable. So too much engineering cost to automate, automate each job and too much space for hard, classical hard automation. And this um, points to me to the fact that um, whether we like it or not, making progress in manufacturing points us in the direction of a hardware and behavior generalists. It doesn't make economic sense to automate each one of these tasks because each one is different. So whether it's possible or not, whether it's a, a bet that we're gonna um, succeed or not, if we wanna make progress in manufacturing, we have to make progress towards both hardware and behavior generalists. And it's very hard, right? So it, this means uh, a, a few very important things, right? It needs to give us a path to simple retasking. If a robot has to do the next thing, it shouldn't take what takes now about a year of engineering to automate a new task. Um, it needs a path to very high reliability, 99.x percent. Um, it needs to a path to very high precision. So when you look at the statistics, um, in the order of 88% of the tasks that people are doing um, in these factories involve placing parts within less than three millimeter precision or more precision than three millimeters. And that just tells me that most of these tasks are some kind of insertion, some kind of haptically driven uh, precise manipulation task. Uh, we need a path to be able to handle high force, large workspace in complex environments. You saw people like going inside the cards and putting parts inside. Um, and very important, a path for early deployment in assembly lines, right? We cannot hope that we're gonna be able to do this if the constraint is that we have to put a machine that we turn on and it's gonna work 99.7% reliable uh, from day one. We need a simpler, uh, uh, like a smoother path to be able to uh, do early deployment. Okay, so very complex. Um, let me backtrack a little bit and talk a little, uh, about what we've been doing at Boston Dynamics and start with this video, um, which you might have seen. This is Atlas doing um, a particular logistics workflow. It's doing sequencing. So it's placing these engine covers in a dolly that presumably is going to be brought to the assembly line and every slot in that, uh, in that dolly uh, is, uh, is going to go to the next car in the assembly line. Uh, because there's not enough space in the assembly line to have all variations of all kinds of engine covers, we need to sequence them in order uh, to get them right to the person that is going to be assembling them. And um, it's very important to us that the, <coughs> the system overall uh, is agile uh, not just in its behavior, but also in its reasoning and its perception system. So that if something like this happens, that a part falls to the floor, uh, Atlas can recognize that, go pick it up and bring it back. To where it's supposed to go. Okay, so what are the workflows of a robotic specialist like this, right? So. We, need, uh, we have assets, we have perception models, manipulation skills, and then tasking the entire mission. How do we tell Atlas to do this job that involves moving 30 parts, uh, one after the other one? And you can break it down and you can build models and modules for each one of these. Um, maybe this is a different way of representing it. Um, and um, you get, that you can sort of modularize and then optimize, right? This is sort of like a good fit for the structured tasks where the modularity of, these, um, um, of this system allows to optimize performance. We, for every failure mode that happens, we can identify, we can assign blame to one of these modules and then improve their performance. And that's great, that gives us control and allows us to get to that 90 something percent reliability. But for the same reasons that the modularity allows us to be specific about failure modes and then correct for them, it sort of kicks us in the bag uh, 
uh, because it goes against the notion of generality, right? So economically, it's not feasible to do that effort for every single task. <clears throat> so the, the question is, how do we go from a system like that that is capable of accurate perception and accurate uh, manipulation to a system that can do equivalent behavior at the same level of performance, but now without that amount of um, um, effort in or engineering in putting it together. And um, <clears throat> I just like to paint these as swim lanes, right? So there's clearly ideas for how we can get there somehow to end-to-end -end models, and that there's questions about like what is the right slice, vertical slice of this sort of potential transition um, or journey into end-to-end -end models that make sense for something like manufacturing, which is fine, it's like it's, it's good questions, but to me the most important questions that, that I think that, um, <clears throat> that I'm interested in is what are the swim lanes that we have to enable to generate the data that potentially could create those end-to-end -end models one day. And uh, I'm just gonna give a couple examples of things that we've been doing at BD um, in that regard. Here's learning visual dextrose demonstration, uh, dextrose manipulation with reinforcement learning. So <clears throat> a good fit to generate behaviors that are dynamic, that show generalization because you can scale simulation to, um, uh, easily and with, uh, without too much cost. And sort of interesting that you, when you scale that effort, you start to see the emergence of uh, behaviors that are more dynamic than what we could program ourselves, uh, including things like failure detection and retry. So <clears throat> the system has been trained with, I would say, like standard today, um, a student teacher training uh, algorithm. This is a collaboration with NVIDIA, by, by the way. And then it's distilled to just using RGP. And just by the fact that it has to be able to grasp a large number of objects, um, some of that um, um, capacity for generalization uh, comes out. It's n none of these objects here in the video, by the way, were used during, during training. Okay, so this has the ability to generate a certain kind of data. Um, similar um, pipeline, but for now whole body control, you might have seen this video too. Um, having a robust sim to real pipeline where you can provide some human demonstration in the form of mockup and then turn it into use RL to correct the demonstration and turn it into a, an actual behavior is a way to generate, again, robot data that um, shows a degree of agility and a degree of naturality that is um, much higher than anything we've been able to do at BD. Uh, for example, like doing something like this was kind of impossible um, a couple years ago for us. And then scaling this, um, this sort of pipeline to train a generalist body policy that um, can replace eventually our MPC-based uh, whole body controller is something that uh, we're working on. Just gonna let this run for a second. If you haven't seen it. That one is not done with a human demonstration. <laughs> okay, and the final one, um, <clears throat> whole body teleoperation allows to um, create demonstrations of not just uh, manipulation behaviors with the hands, but sort of in the context of the kind of uh, low reach, uh, high reach, and whole body motions that are necessary for many of the tasks that uh, I was showing before. Okay, so clearly the community uh, in general sort of has interest in moving to the right. Um, but one point that I wanted to make before finishing is sort of, um, this is my opportunity for a rant or a concern, that I think that in this space we are not making enough progress um, on teleoperation. And let me just make the argument. It goes like this. So we say humans are good manipulators. They're really good. So let's just learn from demonstration, which I think is a great uh, way to get there. Um, so then we're saying, well, in humans, I think agility and dexterity are mostly a system one thing. 
I don't know if you're familiar with system one, system two, but basically the idea is that system one is in charge of our instinctive, reactive behavior, uh, while system two is in charge of our conscious thinking, uh, analytical behavior. And um, so the point is that most of what we do that involves dexterity and agility we are so good because it's all ingrained in our instincts, right? So through billions of years of evolution and years of uh, learning, we've managed to pack all that in our instincts. Um, just a quote from Matt Mason there, manipulation is an art because we do it in a way that we just don't know how we do it, um, basically, paraphrasing. But my concern is that I suspect most teleoperation that happens today is forced onto people uh, by tapping into their system too. They have to think too much, and then that leads to inefficient demonstrations. <clears throat> it leads to behaviors, to a footprint of data that it doesn't represent human capability. Um, so it leads to lacking dynamic content, it leads to unnecessarily sequentiality of behaviors in doing the thing, and it is a good step forward, but I think it doesn't represent what we could do from demonstration. So, to really learn from human demonstration capacity at scale, we need more transparent sources of demonstration. There might, there might be improvements in teleoperation, but it could be other sources, um, <clears throat> which I think we as a community have the responsibility to unravel and just make, make it happen. Um, okay, just, I think I'm out of time, so I'll just keep the summary slide, and thank you everyone. Okay, uh, we have time for a question. If anybody would like to go to the microphone. Hi, thanks Alberto, very nice talk. Um, I have one question uh, relating to the last rant on teleoperation. Um, so your robot that you showed, um, um, you know, in one video, it, it really uses the weird kind of joints that it has, right? Like it rotates in a way that uh, a human couldn't do. But then in the later slides, you show the teleoperation system to collect data. Yep. And of course, people can't do these kind of weird motions, right? So you kind of lose the dexterity that your robot actually has by relying on teleoperation. But of course, you get the benefits of collecting this data that otherwise you would need to maybe, um, you know, uh, somehow hard code or uh, script in a way. So I'm wondering, how do you resolve this tension between uh, you know, trying to get data through teleoperation, but also not losing the dexterity of your robot. Yeah, that, that's a fantastic question, and I would say we, the, it, it is not the tension that we've resolved. It's a very active point of discussion inside the company, and that um, there's like <clears throat> a demand for one side or the other side. Um, right now, what we do is we just use both sources, right? So in this case, we have uh, a mock-up system, that we can use people to generate traje reference trajectories that then we use our all to track. Uh, but on the other side, we have animators that generate reference trajectories that exploit uh, a much larger set of potential behaviors that uh, just people are not able to. Um, so I think that um, I don't see necessarily as a one or the other one. Um, I do see that it is true that if we want to tap on the scale of human demonstration, we are limiting ourselves to extra human behaviors that have huge value, right? Like Atlas can turn um, like in less than a second from facing forward to facing back um, because it can just rotate its knees and its back and all of that stuff, uh, which is very difficult to demonstrate. 